Privilege escalation by a kernel exploitation. Napoleon, like anyone can even know that. Hi friends, so today's introduction is a little lengthier than usual, so if you prefer to just jump straight into the lesson, go to this time marker now. Please, please, I don't have any time for any gossip now. Eh? Yes. So if you're still here, welcome. So today, as part of our Learning C2 with Metasploit series, I'll kick off a whole series of videos on privilege escalation. Specifically, in this video and the next one, we'll be covering privilege escalation via kernel exploitation. Privilege escalation via kernel exploitation. Privilege escalation via kernel exploitation. So the reason I'm dedicating two videos to this topic is that I would like for us to achieve the same outcome by following two different paths, that being with Metasploit and without Metasploit. Now many people advise beginners to steer clear of Metasploit when you start learning a raid teaming. And this is not because Metasploit is too advanced for beginners, but rather because Metasploit simplifies so many aspects of raid teaming that it can actually impede your learning journey. In effect, Metasploit black boxes and takes care of so many elements you'd usually need to do manually. And so if you solely rely on Metasploit, you can develop major blind spots. Now, I agree with this sentiment, but with a caveat, because in my opinion, I think there is a third path that's even better. And that is when we perform the same action with Metasploit and without Metasploit, and we critically compare the two different approaches. What I really like about this approach is that it shows us at the same time what is both unique and not unique to each different path. When we start to understand the commonalities across all the different techniques, it really helps us to better internalize what it is we are actually doing. And additionally, for beginners, it really helps us to remove our blinders because sometimes we get stuck on this idea that every single machine only has a single solution. So by solving the same machine in different ways, it really helps free us from this limiting mindset. Free your mind. So far in this series, we've only been attacking virtual machines that we've set up ourselves. Now this is my preferred way to learn as it really promotes systems level thinking, but at the same time, it has a major limitation. The limitation of course, is that it would be nearly impossible to create a virtual machine that covers every single possible vulnerability. And so because of this, from now on, we will supplement our approach of attacking our own virtual machine by also introducing specific machines from the Hack the Box platform. So in today's lesson, we'll be gaining system level privileges via kernel exploitation by using Metasploit. The specific hack the box machine we'll be attacking is called Devel. Sometimes I think you don't have any respect for me. And you can find the link right at the top of the description. So I do plan on making a very extensive theoretical exploration of all of privilege escalation in the future. But for now, if you would like to know a little bit more about what kernel exploitation is and what it entails, i.e. the theory underpinning it, I've posted a link to an excellent lecture on this topic by Zach Ecob right at the top of the description. But in any case, methinks that's enough with all this flippin' dilly-dallying for now. So let's get to it. All right, friends. And so you can see I'm here in my terminal on Kali and I've already connected to the machine, so all that's done on the backside. Again, this isn't going to be a CTF walkthrough, so I'm not going to go through every single step of how you would solve a typical CTF ad nauseum. Uh, rather, let's just kind of quickly get our foothold so we can get to the real focus of today, which is, of course, privilege escalation using kernel exploitation. All right, so the first thing we'll do is our good old friend Nmap, and I'll enumerate for standard versions and run standard scripts. And Devel is 10.10.10.5. 10, 10, A few moments later. All right, friends, and here you can see our results. So we can immediately see two ports are open, 21 FTP, as well as 80 HTTP. So let's just look at it a little closer. Uh, the first thing that obviously stands out for us looking at the FTP uh, is that anonymous login is allowed. And uh, not only is anonymous login allowed, it's showing us a directory overview of the files on the FTP drive. And if we look at these files, something immediately stands out to me. Now, for those of you that didn't know, there are three major web servers that are the three most popular servers that people typically run. Uh, the first two are Linux, and they're called Apache and Nginx. And the third one is the sole Microsoft web server in this top three, and it's called IIS. And so we can immediately notice that they're running Microsoft IIS on the web server on port 80. Uh, but if we look at these files, you can even see their IIS start.htm. 
So immediately this looks to me as if these are the files that are the default files if you've just freshly installed IIS. So let's quickly go have a look at the website and we see the website and we see that the website itself on port 80, right, is still the default install. And, and I don't know if you remember, we just saw welcome.png. Uh, and if we looked, if we inspected this, uh, there we can see indeed this is welcome.png. Uh, so perhaps you've now already like put two and two together. Uh, but if not, no worries. Let's quickly head back to the terminal. And so what it basically is, guys, is that the files here that are on the FTP server are basically the files that are being hosted and displayed by the HTTP server. And so we can immediately think that if we're able to perhaps upload something on the FTP server, we will be able to access that file that we uploaded via the HTTP server. And what's something that we love to be able to upload and execute? Of course, any script or payload that can do a reverse TCP connection back to a listener on our end. And so immediately, even before logging on, I'm just going to use MSA Venom and create a payload. But right before we do that, we can run IPA to just quickly check our IP address. And now here's another thing, guys, if you're not used to hack the box, you know, you typically look at your IP there and then you think, well, that's my IP. And this is obviously the interface of my private LAN. So that's my private IP address. But right now we're tunneled, you see, ton into another network where I am now on the hack the box network. The hack the box network has no idea that on my local LAN, this is my IP. Instead, when we connected with a VPN to the hack the box network, it assigned an IP to us and this is our IP. So I'm just gonna copy my IP. Next thing we'll run MSA Venom. So I'll just type MSA Venom, P for payload, and then our shell because we're going to be using Metasploit is an interpreter shell, right? And then finally, we'll choose a reverse TCP connection. So we just saw the L host, just going to paste that. And then L port can obviously be anything. I'll just choose one, two, three, four. Uh, and then the next one is the file type. Now this is pretty important because we want to make sure that the server is capable of actually executing the file. And so for example, I'm sure you've seen before, if you encounter a web server that's using PHP, you typically craft the script in PHP to ensure that that system is able to execute it. So a format we can choose that's a very safe bet on an IIS server would be ASPX. And without going into it too deeply, that's just simply because the ASPX files are part of the ASP.NET framework, which is the server side web application framework used by IIS. And so finally, we can just choose a name and I'll just call it kernel.aspx. So we can see we have successfully generated our payload. So the next step now is to get this payload onto the victim system. So we saw during the Nmap scan that we do have anonymous access to the FTP drive. So then hopefully we'll have the ability to upload this payload to the FTP server, where after we can touch it with the HTTP server. So with FTP, it's very simple. You just write FTP and the IP. It's asking us for a name. And so we'll write anonymous. And for password, again, we will write anonymous. And we can see we're logged in. Let's just run dir. And we can see that the three files that we saw during the Nmap scan are indeed the three files here on the FTP server. So next thing, we'll just upload our payload with the command put kernel.aspx. And we can see that we've successfully uploaded it. And so we can just get out of the FTP server, kind of clear. And now we should theoretically be able to use our web browser to execute the payload. But obviously that's one half of the puzzle. We also now need our handler or listener. And so in this case, I'll open MSF console uh, so that we can create a meterpreter handler. Great, so the first thing is I'll write use multi handler. Now the next thing is we need to choose our specific type of payload. And as I've shared before, there should be an exact reflection of the payload that we created earlier. So we'll write set payload and we did windows interpreter reverse TCP. And we have the three typical options. So first let's set L host. And it's 10, 10, 14, 4. We set L port and we chose one, two, three, four. 
And finally, I'll set exit on session to false. false. Then I'll run with J to put it in the background. And we can see our handler right there. So we have this handler and it's stationed at port 1234. Now it's just waiting for the incoming call, right? And we have our payload on the FTP server. And if we trigger that payload, it's going to call back and give us our connection. So now really the only thing to do is to trigger our payload. So let's go back to our web browser. And here on our web browser, we're simply going to write forward slash kernel.aspx. And let's go check back with MSF console. And we can see right there, Meterpreter session one opened. Can confirm that we can see it. And so the next thing, obviously, let's just use our Meterpreter shell with I for interact and one. Great, and then we have our Meterpreter shell. Now, since, as I said in the beginning, we'll be doing everything with Metaspot in this specific video today, we'll be using an automatic enumerating module from Metasploit called Suggester. Now, I do want to mention that we have a shell on the victim system. And then often I've seen when people get a Meterpreter shell, the first thing they do is just write shell straight away and because it takes them to command prompt, which is something they're used to. And I've actually noticed that some people just basically think Meterpreter is kind of like a stepping stone to just get to a command prompt shell. Um, but Meterpreter offers us a whole lot of built-in tools uh, that we can't get with our regular command prompt shell. And so this is such a case. And so we use the run command, post for post exploitation, multi because it sounds cool, recon, that's what we're doing. And then really the gist of it is the name of the module, which is local exploit suggester. So let's run that. A few moments later. And here you can see the results, friends. You can see there are a whole lot of exploits that Metasploit thinks the system is potentially vulnerable to. So today, of course, since the focus is kernel exploits, we'll be focusing on Kitropod. Now, if you weren't focusing on anything specific, you were just trying to pawn this box like a elite hacker, well then you could literally go through these one by one. You could spend some more time researching each of these, seeing what the typical success rate is, or you can simply use the things that you're familiar with and have worked well for you in the past. But in this case, we'll specifically use Kitropod, and I'm actually just going to right click and copy that because this is now the name of the module we're going to use. And so here we're actually going to background our interpreter shell, which of course means it's still running, but we get to interact with the MSF console again. And also take note what your session number is. In our case, the session is one. And so next I'm just going to write use, and I'm going to paste the name that we just copied of the specific exploit, Kitropod. Gonna hit enter, write show options. Now the first thing we see here right up top is session. And as I just said, uh, my session is one and yours might be different. Uh, the next thing is the L host, which is our L host, which is of course 10, 10, 14, 4. And now the next one is port. I'm going to leave it 444. It can be anything except for the port that's already occupied by our session one, because essentially we're going to use this exploit to create a brand new session in which we should be system. And so really that's it. And we should just be able to run it and immediately get our new shell as system. And we can see we have a new interpreter shell. So let's drop into our command prompt shell. Then let's write who am I? And we can see that we're system. And so basically we've elevated our privileges from the regular user to system, the highest authority. And how do we do that? Well, we did that simply by using a built-in Metasploit module, which allowed us to take advantage of a kernel exploit, which was in turn identified by local exploit suggester, another Metasploit module. So we used a Metasploit model to enumerate, then we used another Metasploit model to then capitalize on this exploit. Okay, friends, well, I hope you enjoyed that lesson. I'll be back with another video shortly where we'll essentially be doing the same thing, but without Metasploit. Be sure to keep a lookout because it will obviously be awesome, but until then, peace out. Mm -hmm.